Hello, Pamela. Oh, you I've got you hidden. You do. There you go. You had to unmute yourself, but you were on top of it. I I'm slowly learning all these tricks for when you decide to make me non-speaking. Right. I have such uh, such control. Um, <laughs> so sorry you missed a great uh, virtual star party last night. It was really it's, good. So, you know, we're working our butts off trying to get yeah. everything for a Wingu done, and uh, it's it's a volunteer project right now, so it's weekends and evenings. And... Yeah, well, we had Nicole and Thad, which was great. Two PhDs. If we add them up, it makes one Pamela Gay, I think. So <laughs> it was good. It was good because it was new moon night, right? So we got really nice dark dark skies. So that was that was really nice. So we had Gary Ganella's uh, just beautiful monochrome images, but it was just really crisp, clear views. And, and we were just going at top speed. We probably went through, I don't know, 15 objects. It was great. Wow. That's, yeah. I, I saw the, the comments coming in on Google Plus and stuff. And yeah, it was pretty like fast and furious. Sounds like folks a really good time. And, and I heard you had some more inappropriate discussions of poo. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, it's what we talk about. <laughs> Astronomy, scatological uh, humor, yeah. Um, so uh, we're going to be, so if, if you're all just joining, I hope you're all settled down, uh, take your chairs. Um, so we're going to be recording episode 272 of Astronomy Cast, uh, Abiogenesis, which is a topic I've, I've had on the list for a long time and I'm really excited about. Uh, so the way this works, if you've never done this with us before, uh, is we record our episode of Astronomy Cast and then, um, and we take about half an hour to do that. And then when we're finished, we're going to, uh, We'll sort of stop our recording. We'll kind of make sure that we got everything nice and saved and good, and then we'll stick around for another half an hour or so and, and answer questions and sort of interact with the with the audience. So, if you've got some questions about what we talk about today, or uh, even just any questions about space and astronomy, and you want to throw Pamela some zingers, uh, now would be your chance. So this is it. Um, <clears throat> and if not, then I will provide the zingers, or I will take your questions and zing them up a notch. Uh, so I think that'll be good. Um, anything else that we need to, uh, to mention? Now we're going to mention, uh, uh, Asteroid Mappers in the show itself. So I think we're good. And, and I'm realizing I have a sun bleached, uh, uh, pop screen on my microphone. Oh, do you? Oh, I know yeah. what I've done. I've left it's... the, uh, I've left the recording on, I left the image on me. So I'm, I just fixed that. It was, <laughs> it was just on me, not on you. So it's okay. Um, there's so many things, so many things to think about. I literally have to make a big checklist, I think, where I can just like, it's like launching, you know, an airplane. You know, go, go through the checklist, tweet this, click that, make sure this is fixed, put in your headphones, start your recording. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. But it actually Google has, has provided one cool little feature that lets me eject people. So if you get So I'm too, just waiting to be ejected exactly, one of these days. Exactly. If you days. get too uppity, I can actually just kick you right out of the podcast and I it's... don't know. Fine, Neil Bring in Nicole. Tyson. I'm told that we're interchangeable. Yeah, no, Neil deGrasse Tyson. That's that's who. <laughs> no, he wouldn't come to. He wouldn't come to Google Plus. He's afraid of Google Plus. <laughs> he does finally have an account in Google Plus. It just doesn't have anything in it. Oh, does he really? Okay. Yeah. Well, the, the Neil deGrasse Tyson fan club is quite busy here, but anyway. Yeah. <clears throat> and this is the kind of stuff we don't even put in the show. So. Aren't you lucky you're watching this? Now, the other thing is we may make some mistakes, so feel free to fix our mistakes. So there's a few ways you can do this. So the first place is if you're watching this from the event page itself that I started about an hour ago, uh, you can ask a question or post a comment or, you know, fix our mistakes there. If there's any topics that you want us to talk about. So on the events page, if you like post a comment in there, I'll see it. Uh, you can also post a comment on the Google Plus page itself. So if you're watching this where it you know says Fraser Kane is hanging out with Pamela Gay, you can post a question there and there's a bunch of comments. Uh, you can also post, a, if you're watching this on YouTube, you can post a comment there. Uh, and then you can also uh, do a post on Twitter, just search for the, or just type in the hashtag AstronomyCast and we will catch it there. So all of that coming into one location, I'll be able to, uh, to answer, answer all of your questions. So, um, okay, great. Well then are you How's your recording this? Oh, I, need my I think I'm ready. <clears throat> okay. It claims to be ready, although it looks like it wants to start recording 31 minutes into the recording. But oh, I need to see one of the things I forgot to do. Just give me a second here. Okay. <clears throat> now, you sure? Is it mono? Do you want to test? I I have it mono. I I actually got that right for a change. Okay. Um. 
Okay, cool. Well, I'm ready, I think. Random comment. Have you noticed that Urban Dictionary is starting to become competitive with Wikipedia in terms of having everything? Oh, really? Yeah. What did you look search for in, in the Urban Dictionary? Well, it actually came up with abiogenesis in the Urban Dictionary. Oh, really? It had a really good uh, description of it? That's I, it has a description of it. It's Urban Dictionary, so it's full of snark. But I, I noticed yesterday while Wikipediaing something that... Yeah, every, everything that I can wiki, I seem to be able to Urban Dictionary now. All right. Um, I told you it was random. <laughs> okay, I'm ready. Are you ready? <laughs> um, okay. I have pressed record. Okay, I'm recording. Okay. Testing, testing, we're good? Yeah. Okay. I guess here we go. Astronomy Cast, episode 272 for Monday, September 17th, 2012, Abiogenesis. Welcome to Astronomy Cast, our weekly facts based journey through the cosmos where we help you understand not only what we know, but how we know what we know. My name is Fraser Kane. I'm the publisher of Universe Today, and with me is Dr. Pamela Gay, a professor at Southern Illinois University, Edwardsville. Hey, Pamela, how are you doing? I'm doing well. How are you doing, Fraser? Doing good. Uh, so once again, as always, we are recording this episode of Astronomy Cast as a live Google Plus Hangout. So you can join us live on the Google Pluses on Monday, noon Pacific, 3 Eastern, uh, 18, no, 2000 Greenwich Mean Time. 8 p.m. Greenwich Mean Time. Uh, or at least and, uh, London time. They're not London time. Yeah, there. and then join us live, and and you can ask us questions, and you can watch us record, and you can see how Pamela uses her hands in the recording <laughs> to to show objects rotating and things flying yes. at the screen. Uh, so so it's a it's a real treat, and you can also see the episodes on YouTube now as well. So. Uh, but it's great to have people join us live. The other thing is we're now doing, I think, four different shows every week on Google+. Yeah. Plus. So we've got our weekly science hour on Wednesdays. We've got the weekly space hangout on Thursdays. We do our virtual star party on Sunday nights and then Astronomy Cast on Mondays. So we've got lots of great uh, science and space coverage for you. But uh, we've got a new project to mention this week, Pamela. We do. So so over on CosmoQuest, we have what's called Asteroid Mappers, which is a new project that takes data from the Dawn mission. And this is data that, that is just released that isn't available in the Planetary Data Center yet. And, and so you can be among the very first people to look at images of Vesta. And we're working on creating a map of Vesta, mapping out where the craters are, mapping out where the boulders are, uh, trying to figure out where other interesting geological features are. And, and so if you want to help out with the, the NASA Dawn mission science team, um, we invite you to become part of what we're doing over at Asteroid Mappers. So join us on CosmoQuest, and you can actually help uh, define the, the craters on Vesta, which the scientists will actually incorporate into their... Uh, their research. So, I mean, that's it. If you ever wanted to contribute to science, now is your chance. That's really, that's really cool. And what I love about this is that these are brand new images. I mean, they're not yeah. coming from, you know, people haven't mapped these craters or seen them no. ever before. These are brand new images, raw from the, the Dawn mission. At the and, highest resolution, so we're not downsampling anything yeah. or, or doing anything like that. Yeah, that's really, that's really exciting. Um, Okay, well, let's get on with the show. Um, so the theory of evolution provides a rich explanation for why we see the diversity of life here on Earth. There are so many lines of evidence, from genetic drift to the fossil record. But how did life start? How did things go from a collection of raw materials to the building blocks of life, giving evolution and natural selection a way to take over? That first step from non-life to life is called abiogenesis, and it's one of the most important questions science will answer. Um, and I said we'll answer because I'm really confident that it will eventually get to the bottom of this. Um, yeah, you're so, more confident on this one than I am. Really? Okay. Well, we'll see. We'll see. Um, uh, so, right. So the point here is, is that whenever you have a conversation with a creationist who, you know, they'll go back, to, you know, the fine, evolution, fine, you know, fine, I'll give you that we're evolved from monkeys, you know, when, or, you know, when really we share a common ancestor with, with, uh, with primates, but you take it for far back and then it's like, where did life come from? The theory of evolution can't explain where life came from. Therefore, the evolution, theory of evolution is, you know, nonsense. 
And, 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 and the reason I'm doubtful on, on science solving this one is simply because I'm not convinced that it's a process that happened fast enough to replicate it in a lab given the current funding cycles of things. <laughs> so it's so really if we what we need is more money for science is that what you're saying? Right. Or yeah. and and uh, allowing people to apply for funding to do things for many years. Um the 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 original Miller Urey experiments uh, those lasted for a couple of weeks. Um, then there there was one experiment that basically froze uh, a bunch of different chemicals that they thought would lead to life from 1972 through 1997. So that that was a nice long baseline, and they were able to see that over this very long period of time, which was short for geology. There were chemical reactions that took place. We're really going to need to have multi-generational experiments to be able to understand all the, the different possibilities. Right, but I mean this is the same argument that's, that's directed at the Big Bang, right? Which is, well, fine, your Big Bang explains the, the rapid expansion of the universe, the motion of the galaxy speeding away from us, the distribution of hydrogen and helium, the cosmic microwave background radiation, but it doesn't explain what came before the Big Bang. Therefore, the theory is invalid. And that, again, is, you know, is, is well, nonsense thinking, right? Which is the, the they're, Big they're Bang. Actu- they're, they're different arguments here. So, so with the Big Bang, we have a theory that... that we can point to and say our mathematical model creates all these different testable ideas. Let's look at the helium content in in non-polluted areas. Let, let's uh, look at the cosmic microwave background. Let's there's all these different things. The problem is we don't have a a theory that is that advanced for the origins of life. We don't know if it formed at at volcanic vents. We don't know if it formed in clays. We don't know if it formed in ices. We don't know if it formed at the surface of the water. So so the these are theories at very different levels of of advancement I guess for lack of a better phrase right but I guess my point is is that the theory just aims to explain what it aims to explain it's not trying to it's not trying to explain things that are outside no, that's of true. of its of its scope so you know evolu- the theory of evolution explains the vast diversity of life forms that we find here on earth uh, the big bang explains the expansion of the of the universe it doesn't explain what came before the big bang and the theory of evolution doesn't explain necessarily where life originated only you know the process that we have that's going on all the time so so that's all and i think that's just really important now and then this this additional theory that with with evolution that kind of bolts right onto it is to say okay abiogenesis how did you get from the raw materials carbon nitrogen oxygen etc into something that could then self-replicate and and go from there. So so let's kind of take this this conversation back to the back to the beginning then. So when did scientists really first start to think about this question? Um, it, it actually, it, in some ways, goes all the way back to Aristotle being wrong in the most amazing ways. So so Aristotle, like with so many of the things he put forward, uh, very wrongly assumed that you could. Uh, think your way into a scientific understanding without actually going out and making any real scientific data observations or experiments. Um, and, and so he, along with many others, thought that life just naturally spontaneously arose. Leave a piece of meat out and it will spontaneously generate flies. Um, slime will spontaneously generate frogs. Uh, dead logs in the bottoms of streams will spontaneously generate alligators. And and so there was this notion that life just occurs. And it took a while to get past that one. But in a way, it took getting to the notion that, well, there are microorganisms, there are things that we can't see, there, there are processes that we, we need to take note of. Um, you can't see with your eyes necessarily that a fly is laying eggs on meat. Uh, what you see is a fly on the meat, and then a while later you see maggots, but without the microscope, which didn't come around until the 1600s, you you can't get at the fact of, oh, there's eggs I can't see in that meat. 
And there's that classic experiment, right? I forget who it was, but they they put a piece of meat under a glass jar and no maggots. There, there, there was a whole different series of experiments. Louis Pasteur's were by far the, the most notable in terms of getting good publicity, um, where, where various scientists, uh, Lozario Palazzoni, um, Fra Francisco Reddy, a, a number of these different individuals demonstrated that if you sterilize something, you don't have the same results. If you isolate something, you don't have the same results. And, and this was extremely important to, to making that connection between there are things that happen outside of the visible world, microscopic world, that lead to real world animals that we do see with our eyes. I mean, it's real world in both cases, but I guess visible world critters. Right. And so, you know, once you, I guess, remove this, the ability for the flies to be able to put in their maggots, then no eggs, no maggots, and the meat yeah. do what you're expecting, although it'll still decay. But I mean, this is, this is the uh, bacteria. Well, actually, meat there, won't right? decay if you don't have any bacteria. Decay requires bacteria. It'll just get really dry. <laughs> right, right. So, so there you go. So now, now, Clearly, there's a source of this stuff. So I would guess fast forward. I mean, then, you know, bring on the germ theory, you know, tremendous advances in microscopes. And then, you know, starting with, I guess, in the 1900s, Darwin comes up with the theory of evolution. And, you know, you can start to trace things back. But this leads this inevitable question. That was, you know? It was actually in the late 1800s. So, so we're still looking back even further. Oh, yeah. Sorry, 1800s. Yeah, 19th century. Yeah, right. Yeah. And so Darwin is, you know, pro comes up with this, the idea of the theory of evolution. But then that leads inexorably to the beginning, which is what, where did the first creature come from? If and, we're all and, connected. And the thing I didn't know until I was researching for the show was... Um, it was actually Darwin who put forward the idea that, and, and this really got to me because this was so early in, in exploration of electricity, but he put forward the idea that if you mix chemicals, fluids, and electricity, um, you have basically Frankenstein's recipe for life. And, and I, I just love how everything came together so early on, but uh, we're still working to try and figure out how how to reproduce this. And it turns out electricity may not be as useful as, as Frankenstein's uh, story right. might purport. Right. Well, I mean, where was some of the sort of first, you know, thinking or experiments in this process? Well, the, the earliest ideas were, were the hot primordial soup notion that, that is still, it, you can't really say there's any leading theories in, in abiogenesis, but one of the sets of theories is that in the early Earth, where, where we're still radiating heat left and right, where we're still dealing with a um, much more active young sun, um, back in these early days, our, our extremely hot ocean that would have had a different acidity than it has today um, quite possibly could have been a chemical reaction ground. You can't say breeding ground. You have to say reaction ground um, for the types of molecules that could eventually somehow make that switch to becoming self-replicating. And I mean, why is that important? I mean, you know, what is the difference between a jumble of chemicals on the ground and, and, the, and life or the building blocks of well, life? So, so this is this is one of those things where there there's actually no leading theory. It could have been a puddle on the ground that formed life. But I think the reason that people start off with the primordial soup idea is is we've all had that experience of of you leave the cup on your table and you have it filled with fluids on a warm summer day, and well, a few warm summer days later, you have something really gross. And <laughs> this is this is, is it the prim primordial soup, <laughs> right, mm, right? I'm going to make some. Does anybody want show. some primordial soup for lunch? <laughs> and so, when you start to think of a large ocean, of of all the right chemicals mixing and slushing, um, and and the early Earth was a kind of dramatic place uh, back during. It, it's thought that during the first billion years or so, we were periodically getting knocked around by sufficiently large asteroids that they released enough energy to evaporate a large portion of, of the Earth's um, oceans, and that would in turn lead to, over time, through the greenhouse effect, the entire ocean evaporating and only 
uh, as the planet cooled back down from that asteroid's impact energy, would the oceans recondense out of the atmosphere. And so you have this evaporative process that's cycling as we get hit over and over, and um, all sorts of carnage occurring. And, and when you think about it, it's like, wow, okay, crazy stuff happening. Life must have emerged from that crazy stuff happening. We don't really have a solid theory, but that sounds good if you're thinking science fiction. Right, but I know that that for example, you know, amino acids are the building blocks of life as we as we know it, um, and you can get to amino acids from this primordial soup, right? Yeah, this is one of the many different ways to get to, to amino acids. One, right. one of the things that that we're we're struggling with is it turns out the universe really likes to create amino acids. Um, they, they're not always stable. Several of them have half-lives of, of a few years to a few tens of thousands of years, uh, depending on the temperatures of the environment they're in. Um, but we find them in space. We find them on Earth. You can create them in a variety of different ways. Um, the original um, uh, Miller-Urey experiment was able to create over 20 different amino acids by, by running all of the chemicals needed to create amino acids um, through a system that included dotting them with electricity, changing the, the pressures, and, and so it, they, they just like to form. It's, it, they're carbon molecules. They do that. Right, but then as the creationists are so happy to expl say, you know, getting from amino acids to proteins is a whole other world, right, to DNA, to RNA. Well, so what, getting... what is thought to be sort of that likely step? And, and this is where, again, many different theories. It's, it's some of the ones that we're looking at that I think are the more interesting ones are if you take a volcanic rock and you run uh, fluids through it at high temperatures, it actually creates basically sludge. And the sludge that comes out has um, molecules that are encased in a chemical membrane. And this starts to resemble cellular organisms. And so perhaps there was some way to get from this membraned molecular sludge eventually to something that was somehow self-replicating. We're not, we don't know. Um, but the one of the processes that allows us to start to get to something that looks like a cell is lava rock plus water given time and heat equals carbon sludge. Um, and we've got other, you know, new environments on Earth that have been uncovered, like places like these black smokers at the bottom of the, of the oceans, which are great sources of water and heat and time. Right. right. So, so there, it you won't actually get to sludge because you're completely encased in water. So that that's where the does it happen quickly at the bottom of the ocean? Does it happen slowly at the surface of the planet? And that actually dictates when life could have started to form. Because if life started to form at the bottom of the ocean, that was a much safer place, much earlier than the surface of the planet. So you, you can actually give life a half billion year head start by starting it at the bottom of the ocean. Um, and I mean, what's really always so fascinating is how quickly life got started. I mean, the earth is four and a half billion years old, but I mean, we have evidence of life as old as what, about 500 million years to a billion years after the earth. It's, formed, we we right? think that we're finding life it fossilized bacteria, basically, um, from roughly 3.9 to 4.2 billion years ago. Trying to date things is always right. complicated. But um, essentially, at the moment after the Earth cooled down to the point that, that this kind of thing would be possible, life arose. Yeah, that, yeah. that's pretty much what, what we think. Um, and so it's just trying to figure out, well, there's always that possibility that it arose at the bottom of the ocean. It arose on the surface of the planet. We could have had multiple points of origin. So this is where we start looking at extremophiles. This is where we start looking at um, chemical reactions under a variety of different pressures, under a variety of different liquid, lack of liquid. So, so did life perhaps start in clays where we end up with different mineralogies that start to resemble nanobacteria very closely? It's a fine step between certain uh, mi microbes. I No, nanobacteria isn't a microbe. It's a, it, between minerals and nanobacteria, it's a very fine line occasionally.
But I think one of the other pieces of evidence that we really have is that we appear to be able to trace all life on Earth back to a common ancestor, right? That that all life is is related. So well, we don't, all living life. All living life. So so you, we have to remember that there there's the methanogens, the the critters that uh, respirated methane instead of oxygen, that was a completely different tree of life. So it's unclear, did we get from that to this? Did they have a common ancestor or are they actually two different genesises? Really? I didn't know that. Yeah, it's, okay. So We don't, so words, we don't could... always have DNA of, of the oldest bacteria. Right, of course, yeah. I mean, four billion year old bacteria in a rock doesn't really tell you much. But, right. But, um, but I guess you could have the situation where if life was super common, then you might see multiple genesis, genesis yeah. on, on Earth. But in this case, it seems like the, the life that really took off and took over the whole planet does share this common ancestor. And, and it's, it's impossible to know, though. Um, was it simply that this life was more efficient and killed off everything else? It's, it's now thought that Homo sapiens, or rather Homo erectus, I'm not sure which, and Neanderthals coexisted, and it's simply we out-competed. And, and so we, we don't know if it was an out-competition, we don't know if it was a single origin, and, and so this is where there's a lot of open questions, and because we have plate tectonics, we can't answer everything. Yeah, I mean, you can imagine the whole planet being this really fertile um, environment that life wants to be able to expand into and exploit every single niche once it's got a ready form of energy and, you know, it's got fuel source, it's got things that, you know, e elements that it can use and it's, you know, it can consume and, and get rid of, then you can imagine it trying to expand into every possible niche on Earth, which it has, you know, it's evolved, you know, and I'm sure it didn't take life that long to expand into every possible niche on the planet in some slime mold kind of bacteria way and so if you had these two life forms that had started separately running into each other one probably would have been better equipped to to take over those niches than the other and and it, yeah these these are the types of things that we're still trying to figure out we know that we do find life uh, deep in the soils when we're digging for oil, not we, but when other people are digging for oil. Uh, we find it in uh, extremely acidic uh, pools of water. We find it in hot springs. We know that, that certain critters are resistive to radiation. Uh, some like living in ice. So life has exploited just about every place on the planet Earth that, that you have a temperature gradient and you have uh, something that can be consumed as a nutrient. So as long as those two things are present, we seem to be finding life. Now, you know, we're talking about life as we know it, right? Mm -hmm. The standard carbon-based life forms with DNA and RNA. Has there been much thought into sort of life as we don't know it? Well, it, it, this is actually a well-timed episode because uh, an article just came out suggesting that we do need to rewrite the Tree of Life to include some of the macroviruses that um, the largest viruses that are out there actually resemble in many ways the most simplistic uh, DNA-based microbes. So uh, perhaps we simply need to start broadening our thought. There are people who uh, consider broadening things out um, to, to start including prions, which, which are basically proteins that affect the brain as potentially a life form. Um, and then, of course, there are the folks that are trying to do things like replace phosphorus with arsenic, replace carbon with silicon, and look for a parallel way of constructing the chemistry of life by just dropping a, a row down the periodic table. And that sounds like it's going to be a pretty fruitful direction to go as well because we're getting to the point now where, I mean, we're seeing synthetic life forms. I know there was a synthetic uh, virus created just a couple of years ago where they essentially just wrote the, you know, they used a DNA printer and they printed out the genetic code of it and they injected it into, was it bacteria? And, yeah. and, and boom, you had, a, you had bacteria. Right, that well, that roughly it, matched the the same sort of effect of the of the actual creature. So we're getting to the point now where, with these with DNA DNA splicing and these kinds of things, you can start to run these experiments. You can kind of go, what if we do this? What if we do that? You know. So. And yeah. and 
it's it's unclear how fruitful looking for life made out of parallel chemistry is going to be simply because the the energies involved aren't the same the frequencies of the materials involved aren't the same but we we are getting better at at engineering life uh, from from inserting vaccines into potatoes to uh, creating glow in the dark cats to to a whole variety of different things um, we're we're changing life and uh, this is it's it's fascinating to see how this is also changing science fiction there there was a excellent book um, I believe it's called The Wind-Up Girl by Paolo Bagogobalu. I can't say his last name. Look up the Hugo Award winners from two years ago. And it's a look at, at a future where we've genetically engineered animals that end up out-competing the wild ones. And so we end up losing our planet's genetic diversity because we create these things that simply take over and we see this happening in North America with a lot of invasive species I know in Europe they're having a lot of problems with mice being an invasive species porcupines being an invasive species and it, it's unclear if if we've properly thought through the morals of some of the things we do there's many nations that, that are starting to consider okay do we need to take a step back from the genetically modified plant species that we're distributing uh, now, now one last question then is, uh, you know, there's a lot of news. We've been talking about curiosity quite a bit and the whole goal here where curiosity is going to be searching for not necessarily life on Mars, but it's going to be searching for the conditions of life to see if the, the chemical precursors. Yeah, if the conditions were ever uh, present for that life could have arisen on Mars. But, you know, we have this also this problem with panspermia, right? How how we've got this situation where even if we do find life on Mars, there's enough rocks traveling between Earth and Mars that we if we find life, it might be related to us. Right. And and this is one of those things where uh, it's an open question. Did life on Earth originate on Earth? Did all life on Earth originate on Earth? It it could be both was is the correct answer and and the same is true for Mars uh, we find rocks on the surface of Earth that came here from Mars when Mars got hit by large asteroids and and the debris actually got put into escape velocity uh, and traveled all the way to Earth and similarly Earth over history has been hit by large rocks that that have sent things into space. My favorite Scientific American caption of all time was um, the extinction of the dinosaurs was created by an asteroid that hit and and then in the caption it says sent uh, rocks, debris, and dinosaurs into to orbit and beyond. Um, and and that, that would be true. Is is Can you imagine you're the dinosaur there, you're happily munching, you look up, you see something shooting through the atmosphere and you die but then you get sent into space is a puddle of, of right. biological debris. Your parts get sent to Mars. Yes. To help out the Mars uh, biology. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, <do> true. You, <laughs> I know, I know, I know. Um, so do you think that, that we would ever get to the point maybe where we could start to observe life on other planets using some of the techniques that we're learning here on Earth? Could we, you know, using our telescopes? Well, I, I think observing life is, is a little bit extreme. I think saying that we can observe atmospheres that are out of chemical equilibrium in ways indicative of life is something we can say. We know that, that oxygen doesn't naturally occur freely unbound in atmospheres. That needs plants. We know that certain chemicals uh, don't occur in certain ratios in the atmosphere unless you have things like humans with diesel engines. So as we look at other planets, we may see the, um, unfortunately, the signs of a polluting industrial uh, economy not too different from our own that is destroying a planetary atmosphere um, in terms of being in natural chemical equilibrium. So that, that's what we look for is things out of equilibrium. Right. It would suck to be them, but it would be good for science. Hey, we're there too. We can't really say very yeah, much. They can spot us, so we can spot them. Yeah. Very cool. So let's, last thing, and I know this is completely worthless, but why don't you know? Let's come up with a prediction here. So, so I'm a total optimist, and and I actually think that science will crack this. Not you know within the next, I'm going to say decades, two decades. See, I I think that we're going to be able to say whether or not life 
is common by either finding it or not finding it on other rocky bodies in our solar system. I, I think answering the question of did it originate on land or at sea, um, Paul Revere had a much easier job than the biologists do. What's the, yeah, I mean, the, you want to get to that point where they can just kind of go zap and then boom, there's life, and then zap again, there's life. And, so and I really think it was probably a process that caused, that took so long that, right. that there's just not going to be the patience within the funding cycle. Right, but I love the fact that you were able to sneak in a, you know, we should fund science uh, <laughs> advertisement right into this podcast. Well, so. we need to fund things that are longer than four years for science. Yeah. All right. Well, wonderful conversation as always, Pamela. Thank you very much for joining me this week, and we'll see you next week. Thank you. It's been my pleasure. Saving. So don't go anywhere. Don't All go we're anywhere. doing is ending our recordings. Uh-oh. That's your favorite sound. And sniffling into the microphone. Sorry, everyone. It's hay fever season. Quite literally, they're harvesting the hay and the corn and the soybeans. Are they really? Yeah. And, and all the fields are getting replaced with ragweed that then springs up to take advantage of the corn not being there. Just make sure I get the save. Sorry, this is the paint drying part of the episode. Um... Yeah. Okay, I saved it. Now I'm going to export it. Okay, I'm safe. I'm safe, but for how long? Um. Okay, so uh oh, you know what? Oh, man. Tim Hem just asked a question that I thought was great, which is how much active research is there going on, especially into abiogenesis? And I guess, you know, is there some controversy? And so is that controversy making people not want to go into this area of research? No, that's that's not a concern. There's no. there's actually a whole lot of, of people who, who are studying this, especially through astrobiology funding. Yeah. Um, okay, so right, so we'll stick around now for another half hour. So we're glad to ask to answer any questions you might have about space and astronomy. You can uh, you can post your questions into the event page, uh, or you can post them into the Google Plus page where the recording is being displayed. You can use the uh, hashtag AstronomyCast either on Twitter or on uh, Google Plus, or you can uh, post your question onto YouTube. So, um, and we'll ask, we'll go from there. So, Tom Nath just said, um, uh, finding an Earth fossil on Mars would be bizarre. Uh, that would be bizarre, wouldn't it? If there was like a big old dinosaur bone, you know? Well, finding a big old from... dinosaur bone, that, that would be, because most meteorites aren't that big. Um, I, admittedly, the Martian atmosphere is much thinner, so it will be far less destructive to incoming rocks. Um, but, but I think the idea of, of, I don't know if you've ever been to New Mexico, but um, like Sunspot Observatory, you go walking around the observatory, which is a national park, so you're not allowed to take the fossils away with you. Um, but, but as you walk around, there's just like rocks, and you look down, and it's like, ooh, leaf. Um, so I can imagine finding meteorite that you break apart, and maybe not leaf, but, but stuff. Yeah, yeah, actually, you're probably right, right? That if, you know, big enough asteroids have impacted the Earth and blasted solid enough chunks of rock that there would almost inevitably be fossils that would have yeah. made, that, made that journey and then they would have plunked down on the surface of Mars. That would be confusing, I think, if they, if they turned up a leaf or a worm or a you know, well, fish tooth. Well, the, the nice thing about meteorites is, is they trap within them the uh, atmospheric volatiles that, that are a signature of what planet they came from. And, and so you can, through chemical testing, actually figure out where the different rocks originated. Uh, Graham asks, uh, so is there an answer to Sir Fred Hoyle's jumbo jet being built by a tornado in a, in a junkyard? Which, I, I mean, you've probably, if you've read some evolutionary stuff, this is this comment, which is like, you know, how could life arisen? It would be like a tornado blasting through a junkyard and out coming a, a jumbo jet. But, See, it, it actually isn't that... Uh, big of a step, uh, mm -hmm. literally you take lava of the right type of lava, like from a cone volcano down in Hawaii, mix it with hot water and let it just sort of filter through 
um, in a hot system and you start to get naturally forming complicated molecules that have an outer membrane and it, it's very similar to, to the most simplistic bacteria and, and as soon as you start being able to form complicated molecules that, that have skins and other things like that you can see that this is just a chemical process that, that organizes things to form lipids, that organizes things to, to well, there's lots of different things that, that we see in molecules and we know how to rec recreate them. This is where we're now starting to be able to use 3D printers to create skin. Yeah. Um, it's just a chemical process. Yeah, and it doesn't need to be that complicated, right? All it has to do is make it so that it's a little bit self-replicating. Yeah, and that's really all you need is that something happens that that gives that one little molecule or that one little particle a you know some way of of glomming onto another particle and and and, and that's really just kind of it. And and you, I think using the DNA. word self replicating is, is actually part of the controversy. What we need is self catalyzing. So right. so it's a chemical reaction that uh, creates what's necessary to keep the chemical reaction going. And once you start looking at it as an a, um, ongoing chemical reaction, well, we see stuff like that all of the time. Uh, so Roger asks, um, how long can a bacteria in... Uh, oh, so, so if a large dinosaur travels through space, uh, how long can the bacteria in his stomach survive? Okay. <laughs> so, I, I suspect that, that it got thoroughly dehydrated in the process. Right, but the no, but the point. I mean, I guess the point is, bacteria is unkillable. Some uh, of it, yeah. Some of it is really unkillable, and they they actually found there was the um, what the lunar one of the the lunar explorer mission that was on the surface of the moon, and then in one of the Apollo missions, they they grabbed it, they grabbed the camera system from it, and brought it back to Earth, and in that they found bacteria that they were yeah. able to uh, put in a petri dish and, and get it going again and it had been sitting out on the surface of the moon one of the most inhospitable environments yeah there are and it you know it survived well and uh -huh. and archaeologists are forever turning up uh, random ancient glass things filled with wine and preserved food and preserved seeds and one of the things that that I, I haven't confirmed but I was told while in Cairo um, is that the the plant needed to create papyrus had actually pretty much gone extinct for a while and then they found in the tomb seeds and so they've started regrowing the thing that the plant that's needed to make papyrus scrolls um, based on finding seeds that would still germinate and uh, and then there's of course the water bear yes it, the, can't be killed no, it's uh, Google water bear um, extremophile, and it's this cute little uh, bacteria that has a very long Latin name that begins with a T. And uh, these things have been on heat shields and happily come back to Earth. These these things, you can dehydrate them and rehydrate them, and, and they just go and go and go. Yeah. And th there's actually a plush version you can get from the, the microbes, yeah, plush microbes my company. My kids love those plush microbes. I got a ton of them around the house here. <laughs> um, uh, so Tom Nath says, have any biochem experiments that replicate the lipids and other easy stuff have been, been run for years on end or decades? And I think that's what you're driving at, right? Which is that, yeah. you know, we go back to that, that whole uh, jumbo jet in a junkyard concept that, you know, it's, it's all about time. It's about putting all the raw materials together and then just, going for time and time and right. time and so one of these these lipid you know these, these experiments that you're talking about really it's just about you know pushing uh, organic molecules through the muck yeah for decades on end to see what happens and then take the end product and then see if you can do something with that and well and and if you're looking at a low probability reaction you need to allow the the chemicals to to be mixing and sloshing together uh, for long periods of time to allow the probability to lead to the reaction actually happening. Right. It's very similar to the way they detect neutrinos, right? They have these gigantic vats of water, and then they're looking for just the occasional yeah. zap in there, right? It's about or, the... 
or the the better analogy is the 20 centimeter hydrogen line that is observed by radio astronomers this is an extremely rare and improbable um, spin flip in the hydrogen atom but because there's so much hydrogen out there and because it is given the immensity of time over over the age of the cosmos these these little hydrogen atoms have time to periodically do that flip that gives off the 20 centimeter line and so if you leave hydrogen in isolation where no collisions take place long enough it's given the chance to spin flip and we've mentioned this in the past that you know if you take large amounts of time you know billions of years hundreds of millions of years large amounts of space volume material interesting things can happen you know even if it's a super rare event I'm, you know I'm starting to get convinced by your line of thinking now <laughs> well it's just that you know that that it's about having large experiments where you take you know billions of tons of this this uh, volcanic gloop and just keep looking for certain things to pop yeah. out so that you can then, you know, kindle the fire into the next stage of life. Uh, oh, Nicole wants to mention that water bears are actually animals, not bacteria. They're, they are, are they animals. really? They are they're animals. an extremophile. I have no clue what an extremophile they is in animals, terms of though. animal versus bacteria. Yeah, so they're animals, not bacteria, okay. which makes it even more phenomenal how, how super both adorable and long living. Although you look at them really close under the mm -hmm. microscope and they get a lot less adorable looking when you see that kind of their mouth is like this teeth. It, it looks kind of like a lamprey mouth. Like a lamprey, yeah. Like replace a bear's head with a lamprey's head and then you've got, you know. Just the snout part. Yeah, just the snout, yeah. Um, <laughs> so I think that was, that was good. Uh, so Ilya Sarah asks, what about are we just a life form that was created by a previous life form? Um, we don't think, know. We don't know, and and I mean that unfortunately just pushes the problem back a step. Yeah. So, then it becomes the movie Prometheus. <laughs> right. Oh. Oh, that movie's in a harsh need for a mystery science theater <laughs> takedown, a riff track. Um, but uh, but yeah, right. So I mean, absolutely. And this is one of the theories that where life comes from on Earth, right? Which is the panspermia concept that in fact you know, life is constantly raining down. Or or the analogy I like is from Men in Black where they open the locker and there's this entire ecosystem inside of the locker. Um, right, but right, but the point being that, you know, not only are, are we getting asteroids from Mars, we're actually getting asteroids from other solar systems. Yeah. You know, we're actually probably getting particles. We're probably getting, you know, if it's, there's it's more particles there. than rocks, but yeah. Right. But we're possibly getting you know long-lived bacteria from these other worlds as well so yeah. uh, so you can kind of imagine this situation where the moment the earth cooled down it's there's this constant stream of these of this organic material coming from a whole other solar systems any one of which could contain could contain life so so in fact you know one controversial way to think about this is in fact life has been trying to do this for 13 billion years not just the four and a half billion years we have here on Earth. So well, that... you, you had to wait for there to be carbon in sufficient densities to... Right. to I mean, that, that's the thing, is, is the universe did start hydrogen, helium, trace amounts, lithium, beryllium. So you needed to get a few supernova under your belt before we could get to stars and planets. But, but capable the point of being, sustaining life. Right, but the point being that then within the Milky Way, you don't have to just think about the number of times, the, number, the amount of volcanic mush... Uh, interacting here on Earth, yeah. you actually need to multiply it by the number of stars in the uh, in the Milky Way, and think about how much time all of those other stars have had have been you know pushing volcanic mush through. And um, and this takes right? us to Fermi's paradox: is yeah. is if life is common, why isn't it visiting? And uh, and and so that that's a completely different show that we've already done. So go well, listen we to that. We did the first part of it. I actually think, you know, I've done a lot more thinking and reading on Fermi's Paradox, and I think there's some pretty interesting uh, sort of responses to it that I'd love to do another show on that. Okay. You know, like the filter, the concept of the great filter and stuff. I don't know that one. The great filter? Oh. Uh, anyone who doesn't want to be scared can just, uh, you know, end the stream right now. Um, but the, the idea is that essentially, you know, it's that same concept, right? If you drop a piece of bacteria on a sandwich then 
a few days later, you're going to have an entire sandwich filled with bacteria. Mm -hmm. So um, it's that same concept, right? That that if you if life evolves any kind of intelligence, like it, like it's about to, you know, like like we have done here on Earth, mm -hmm. you know, maybe we have <laughs> that we get to a certain point, and life will then start to expand out into the universe, and within a couple of million years, with either you know, our robots or people will have essentially colonized the entire Milky Way. They're only Assuming we ever get sufficient budget to do it. That <laughs> Assuming, yeah. Again, another plug for space uh, for, for space funding, Pamela, nicely done. Uh, <laughs> right? But but you get the situation. So, so in other words, because, you know, even if you go one-tenth the speed of light, you create self-replicating probes, yeah. you should be able to have fully colonized the entire Milky Way in about a million years. So, because the, the you know the Milky Way is yeah. hundred thousand light years across, you know. So then the question is, we went back to the Fermi paradox, right? Which is why hasn't it? Why haven't we got life everywhere? And so the concept is then there must be what's called the 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 great filter. So there must be something that stops life when it reaches a certain level of intelligence from expanding outward and exploring the entire. Uh, universe or the entire Milky Way and so the thought is is that it's probably enforced for whoever got there first now watches all the planets watches for some event like I don't know radio signals or a polluted atmosphere yeah you know? so, so yeah this this is a common theme throughout science fiction right and then says okay you know that world over there needs to be wiped clean so that we can enjoy our monopoly of uh, colonization of the entire Milky Way, and that's the uh, that's called the Great Filter. It's a it's a pretty spooky idea, and you know, there's kind of two filter events, right? One is that life never gets going. We've clearly passed that one. Yeah. So the other one then is life never gets a chance to advance beyond its home system, and we're well, and about and to run the into that one. the the third is is there's that constant background argument that that you reach a certain uh, point and the probability that you're going to get snuffed out by asteroid disease or war is sufficiently great that no civilization makes it long enough to actually become intergalactic. So it depends on how much you trust in life to not right, kill but itself. It, but it, again, it comes back to the, you know, the big numbers, right? Which is that if yeah. you have life possibly simultaneously evolving on four billion different planets, all you need is one or sorry, 400 million worlds, all you need is just one to decide that it makes sense to colonize the entire Milky Way and then kill all other life. Just one. Right? And, and the other option that gets put forward is what if we're the first planet to have developed a civilization? Well, what are the chances of one in 400 million worlds that we're the first? I don't like those odds. <laughs> So like I said, well, the, the great, uh, like I said, a great filter I, I, is a pretty, you know, interesting logic puzzle, and uh, you know, it's a, it's neat. I was actually having a conversation with somebody the other day, and we were talking about how, you know, theoretically in the future, uh, you know, if you can imagine our future, we're going to get to the point where we're going to start to need more and more energy. Yeah. And eventually, we will go for the 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 most energy we can, which is that we'll enclose the sun in a, you know, some kind of sphere or, or even, you know, turn our sun somehow into a black hole, like collide a bunch more material with it to the point that it turns that into a black hole. That doesn't help matters. Well, no, but then you can start dropping material into that black hole and siphoning out the energy that comes out in gamma radiation, right? It still doesn't work that way, but it's a nice fairy tale. Well, I've heard I've heard that it might that that that's a that's the most energy efficient way to get matter to get to get energy that you drop matter into a black hole. It, it, right, but it then piles the, up the, the, disk. the amount of energy required to turn our sun into a black hole makes that a useless proposition. You just collide a few more suns and into it. <laughs> you take three or four suns that you don't need, collide them all together. It's more like you take 10 or 11. Sure, 10, 11, whatever. They've got time. Minimum, that sure, doesn't 10, take into 12, account whatever. things like uh, mass loss through the process. I'm just saying, just saying. <laughs> um, I so, love it when you throw out science completely. I'm not throwing out science. <laughs> you know, is it impossible to direct the, uh, the trajectory of a star? Is it efficient? No. 
I'm not to saying efficient. The efficient. I'm saying if you know, if at the end of the day, if the fuel system works out better, then that's what they'll do. Anyway, the point being that there would be these events, these you know, galactic engineering events that that a sufficiently advanced life form would do, and we would be able to spot them. You know, uh, Brian Simpson is mentioning that I'm talking about Dyson spheres. I'm talking about, I mean, definitely Dyson spheres, but I'm talking about like yeah. the next level where you're just like you're cr turning stars into black holes and then using them for energy. Um, but the point is we would be able to see this because these events would give off a ton of radiation. You know, a Dyson sphere, you would see stars wink out and turn into, um, I guess, infrared, right? So these kinds of galactic engineering feats, you but would But the probability them. of catching the star actually winking out is sufficiently low that that's unlikely. But yeah. there is is a signature in, in the color of what you'd get from a Dyson sphere or more likely from... Um, a ring world or a series of co-orbiting, um, I forget what they call them, but instead of having a complete sphere, you have a bunch of small things right. orbiting. Yeah, um, but the point being that these kinds of events would be uh, visible. That, that you know, And in fact, there actually is a search for Dyson spheres, which I think is yeah. quite amusing. So uh, there are actually astronomers searching through data for Dyson spheres. So... Uh, but the, but the fact that we don't see or haven't seen any of these events, again, is sort of an interesting indication. And and something like the Sloan Digital Sky Survey should have started showing these up if they were common. Exactly, and so that actually starts to bring back that that idea that we are the first, we are the first. Or that uh, people found not people other that civ other civilizations found much more efficient ways than Dyson spheres, which requires you to take a planet and turn it into a spacecraft. Yeah. Um. It it's. It's easy to imagine that they simply came up with something far more efficient than right. creating ice and Anyway, we almost just did our sort of part two of the Fermi Paradox episode <laughs> right here. But that's the that would be the gist. So if people want to hear that, I would love to, to have that conversation with you again. So if you want to give us a thumbs up or a thumbs down, let me know um, in the comments. Um, uh, Thomas is mentioning the energy travel, the speed of light, and then the black hole swallows light and most energy. Uh, so Thomas, yeah, I know the trick is that you pile up the material around the black hole so that it can't get in. Yeah, so, so to make disc. this clear, Fraser is suggesting that we take a black hole, put an accretion disk around it, yes. build a shell around the accretion disk that somehow yes. we're able to get more materials through. Yeah, and then harvest and, and the gamma radiation. And capture the energy from the jets coming off of the accretion disk. Yeah. That's all. That's all I'm saying. You know, nothing hard. Um, uh, so Desi Aitken says that it might be feasible to make a micro black hole in a super CERN, which is actually pretty interesting. Right. right. So, so this is something I think lots of us are hoping will happen, just so Stephen Hawking can please get his Nobel Prize, please. Or not happen, because having microscopic black holes are... Is cool and awesome cool. and harmless. Yeah, right. Okay, fine. Awesome. Yeah, be great. You want to build spacecraft around stellar mass black holes. I just want a microscopic one. So I want to do Nobel lots Prize. of stuff. But yeah. <laughs> um, okay, good. We're getting some thumbs up, so that'd be good. Um, uh, Kokute Yori is asking if the universe is self-aware. We don't know. Well, but but isn't, it, wasn't there a great quote from Carl Sagan, right? Which is that, um, was it intelligent life is the the way the universe, I'm totally mangling this and I apologize, that uh, that, it, that intelligent life is the way the universe it learns about itself or something like that? That that sounds like a quote I've heard, Carl but I Sagan don't... Yeah, I know. Someone's going to post it in the in the comments and then I will take it as my own. So if someone no, remembers but, the, but exact, the exact quote. One, one of the interesting arguments that leads me to say we don't know is... Every human body has more cells that are microbes and bacteria and other external living creatures that aren't DNA part of the human being. Uh, so there's more of these microbes and bacteria on and inside of your body than actual cells that are produced as part of your growth. And so there's the argument that what if we're just the universe's stomach bacteria um, chewing away at the resources on this planet? And, and that through 
some we don't understand it form of life all of these microbes do form a self-aware creature I, I don't think this is true but I'm not gonna rule it out because it's a neat idea so if he's allowed his black holes I'm allowed my well maybe we're just bacteria in in a greater scheme of things um, well I think I'm running out of questions so if anyone has a question we're glad to take it on um, uh, Yako Van Shake wants to know, are you sure you two aren't married? Yeah, we are married, <laughs> just we're not to each other. We're work spouses. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, uh, but the cool thing, though, is is we're going to be doing this cruise at the, yeah. uh, at the end of the year, and our spouses are going to finally get a chance to hang out, which is great. Actually, I've never met your husband. No, no, it's it's most people have never met my husband. It's it's kind of he's he's doesn't like humanity. He's he's a computer programmer. Yes, and, Martinson uh, has brought the knowledge. So Carl Sagan said, "We are a way for the cosmos to know itself." So nice and efficient. Thanks, Jesper. Now, there, there was a quantum mechanics theory paper that said we are actually prolonging the, we are actually preventing the universe from collapsing by observing it because <laughs> the, the time that it takes for the wave function of the universe to collapse gets restarted every time we look at the universe. So <laughs> you are preventing it. the universe's collapse. That's awesome. Cool. All right. Well, I think we've, I think we've uh, exhausted everybody with our um, strange directions. Uh, yes. So thank you once again to everybody who watched us this week. Uh, now, I know it's a bit of a delay when the episodes of Astronomy Cast kind of make it through the system, but this one will be available on YouTube right away if you want to catch it, um, as well as the <laughs> extra banter part. Um, what's up next then? Wednesday, right? Wednesday is the weekly science hour. I'm going to see if I can get someone to come in and talk to us about asteroids, but I admit I'm still in the planning phases because I spent my weekend programming my brain out. Um, the reason I was programming was the Owingu Sky project. Uh, I know what the products are going to be because I'm working on writing the software for them. Um, so if, if you want to help us fund a project that will gamify space and use all of the proceeds to, uh, not all, but use 50% of all incoming funds or more, so it's a guaranteed 50% um, to fund research exploration and science education, uh, please go sponsor our Indiegogo campaign, um, the funding Seven for the Indiegogo campaign. Days left. Yeah, I, six days left, I think. Six days left. The, the funding for the India Go Go campaign um, goes to pay the stupid things you have to pay for, like business insurance and setting up to be able to take credit card payments and an accountant to make sure we did our taxes right. And and setting up an LLC was over $1,000. That really annoyed me. Um, so <laughs> done it before. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Okay, great. And so, but if you and also last week, uh, I talked to Emily Lakdawalla about uh, curiosity, and that was a, a good fun. Emily yeah. is a fount of knowledge and, yes. and really knows her curiosity stuff. And so she was showing all the latest pictures from curiosity, and, and uh, you know, me and the, uh, the folks on the internet were asking her a whole pile of questions. So it was, it was really good. So, okay, cool. We'll, uh, we'll wrap this up here. So, so thanks. As always, Pamela, and we will see you probably, I will see you Wednesday, maybe Thursday, if not, at the virtual star party. Oh, we're going to do some special observing of the moon, I think, on yes. Saturday. So Saturday, yeah. September 22nd is the Global International Observe the Moon Night. So yeah. uh, go celebrate the moon. Yay. All right. We'll see you later, Pamela. Okay. <laughs> Bye-bye. Thanks, everybody.